Welcome, okay, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. I'm going to moderate this meeting. Um, to our Zoom audience out there, I'd like to welcome all of you, as well as everybody in house here at Dappers. Um, tonight, we're going to have Jonathan Parton speaking on the uh, criminal court. And the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, I have announcements by Charlie and anybody in the crowd um, going to, to be announcing the um, uh, events for the community and the upcoming programs. Second, our speaker will speak up to about an hour. Next, we got uh, Jonathan Barton, who's going to be uh, speaking tonight. Uh, he'll be speaking for an hour. Then afterwards, we have a question and answer period. Where we'll ask, we'll have, ask you to ask questions. Then we'll have rebuttals. And after the rebuttals, Jonathan will get the last word. We have to be out of here by 7.30, 7.45, because the restaurant closes at 8 o'clock. Again, my name is Tim. I'll be moderating tonight. Um, all right, Charlie, uh, take it away with the announcements, and I'll get back to my position over here and get the screen up as fast as I can. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,700. At 17 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Now, as usual, I want to give an advertisement. We have a Google email group uh, as well as a meetup email group, uh, which you are recommended that you subscribe to. By the way, if anyone's been getting unsolicited emails from some people, Please let me know and we'll take corrective actions in that regard if you're getting emails which are somewhat spam in character. So please let me know regarding uh, who's responsible for that. Uh, as always, we'd like to ask everyone at home to please put a red X over their microphone, at least during the presentation part of the program. And we ask everyone in attendance, in person, in the restaurant, to please contain their conversation at least during the presentation uh, because it is picked up by the microphone. Thank you very much. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Next Saturday, May the 27th, our own Mike Lehman, a college regular of many years, will be giving us a photo trip through Europe on the French uh, TGV, high-speed trains. The French have the world record right now of operating a train at 357 miles per hour. And trains on their routes at present, not all of them uh, reach train speeds through the route of 200 miles per hour. So please come, uh, and he's got a variety of photographs he's put together of his trip uh, overseas. Transitioning into June, we're gonna talk about uh, violent, nonviolent movement uh, regarding climate change to counter it. Uh, the speaker comes with significant credentials uh, I'm impressed in that regard. He's author of a book, Alter to an Erupting Sun. So on the climate change will be the topic on June the 3rd. On June the 10th, Henrik Kowalski Kowalik will be, uh, he's an author and several articles. He's got a blog regarding uh, foreign affairs of the United States and specifically the situation in the Ukraine. So we'll get an update and what's occurring over there regarding this situation, January, June the 10th. On the 17th, our own Andy Anderson of the Northwest Information Service will be bringing us an update on the topic of censorship, uh, which is a current, current issue. Uh, what has been censored, what has been, what is currently ignored, altered 
or it intentionally blacked out. A hot topic right now uh, being debated in many, many areas. On uh, June the 24th, we're getting, we've got an expert, an academic on global warming, sure, sure. Professor Guy McPherson. will be telling us, talking to us about uh, how, what we can do either both as an individual or as a community to counter global warming. Should be a good evening. And July, on July 1st, yours truly, Charles Paydock. I put together, I just finished it. I am gonna, we've got two special Independence Day speakers. I'm going to give a list of what I have determined to be the 10 most important American heritage sites. No doubt you have seen these historical markers. I'm gonna give you my list of what I think are the 10 most important sites of, the Amer of American history, significant sites. Also, everyone in attendance will be able to make their suggestion on one or more sites that they think I may have omitted and they think are important to the history of the United States of America. So this is a fascinating program. Another award-winning presentation, I believe it is. All right, on July 8th, we are gonna be visited by none other than George Washington himself. I got in touch with him and he said he heard about the college complexes and he's gonna pay us a visit uh, on, on uh, July the 8th. Okay, that leaves three open dates, uh, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th uh, that we need to fill. So if you'd like to speak, please contact me with a title and a written description. I must have both of those in order to confirm a date, a title and a written description. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. Take it away. We have no one to take it away. Oh, okay. No, no. The, 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 the house mic's off. You can speak loudly. That one's good. This yeah. one's good. good yeah. Evening, everybody. Happy Saturday. How's everybody feeling? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, just Jonathan, just speak like normal. Okay, good. Uh, Thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to speak at the College of Complexes. Uh, I really missed it the last three years and I'm very proud and honored and humbled to be here with all of you this evening. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, two people, the uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid of Freedom of Speech in uh, the way that I always do is uh, saying thank you in a way that I would have if I didn't even know about the College of Complexes from attending it, but just met them at the bus stop or the train station or waiting in line at the grocery store and bring up a conversation about civics, uh, letting them know that you are a butch, although I'm not a capitalist, uh, Charlie Paydock Cassidy of Freedom of Speech and the audio visual Zoom virtuoso Sundance kid, Tim Bolger, that, uh, empower us all. So I, I'd, uh, through Zoom, would like to present you once again with a token of my thanks, Charlie, and in person, thank Tim. Uh, for you, this is an estimate. We don't know for sure, because one thing we're really yet to see happen in the United States military is accurate auditing. So they don't really know the exact number, but somewhere between 50 billion and 100 billion dollars in different war zones over the last 20 years have just been lost or uh, stolen or misplaced or they put it down and they don't know who had it, uh, your money. So uh, they're real good about fiscal uh, balancing the budget right now in the speeches, but when it actually comes to uh, keeping track of where the money is, that's actually not the ruling class's strength. 
So I brought Tim and Charlie both a pallet of money today. It's not quite a hundred billion dollars, <laughs> but I want them to know that they're the real deal. They deserve a national grant to someday be at Wrigley Field every Saturday. And I, and I know that's coming from somebody who really loves what they do, but I think once everybody finds out about uh, public assemblies and freedom of speech, uh, you'll have a country that's uh, civically engaged and galvanized to be the best of, of the people, by the people, for the people, civic. So I'd like to uh, ask Tim to come up and accept a pallet of a spider web stream budget amount of uh, finances for me and Charlie will be getting this to you within the next 24 to 48 hours. A token of our appreciation once again for making us all more able to have our voices heard on civics. Thank you very much, Mr. Bolger. It's an honor and a privilege. I'm really happy to be here this evening with you. Charlie, it's humbling and an honor and privilege to be with you in the Zoomiverse. And this is for you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. I appreciate your talks, too. Okay. All right. Okay. I always like receiving gifts. Be gracious in receiving, I say. Okay, Jonathan. It's all right. Just speak normal. We can hear you. Hello. So in 1996, yeah, we can hear. Yeah, we got you, Jack. Jake. In 1996, uh, I had uh, my first ever studio apartment. It was four hundred dollars in the western suburbs, and I couldn't believe it that I found this diamond in the rough, uh, affordable housing in the United States. Uh, somebody who barely graduated high school and did even worse in community college uh, found a roof to put over my head. And uh, I was watching C-SPAN one day in the fall of 1996, and on comes Representative Juanita McDonald of California, and, uh, and the heading of C-SPAN says uh, that the director, John Deutsch of the Central Intelligence Agency is gonna speak at a town hall meeting in Los Angeles about the CIA's involvement in drug trafficking in our most vulnerable, disenfranchised working class communities and how they were going to, they themselves have an investigation into their distribution of narcotics throughout vulnerable communities where there was very few living wage jobs. The CIA was gonna invest themselves. So uh, good luck finding anybody at the top who was responsible for that brilliant idea through that logic. And I got angry and then I got something that I didn't know was a different level of anger, infuriation. And then I said, we need to be involved in a mass movement to get these people out of power, they're corrupt. And I never thought I'd be so angry as when I was watching that town hall meeting when the citizens of the communities of California were asking the questions. So in other words, people are in jail, people have died from the violence, it's the after effect of the narcotics coming into our country. Uh, people's lives have been ruined, families have been torn apart, and uh, now you're going to do an investigation. You're the Central Intelligence Agency, you already know everything. Uh, you should just fire all those people who committed treason. Uh, I did get a little bit anger, in fact, a lot more angrier uh, earlier this spring when I was watching the Jimmy Dore show, one of my favorite, uh, not just satire and uh, social critic shows, but one of my great, uh, favorite journalist shows, uh, which says how much journalism has evolved in the United States. When I heard George Bush giving a speech where he was talking about how uh, the situation was so dire in Iraq, and he said Ukraine. So he basically admitted that the situation in the country that he said he was going to liberate the people who wanted the United States to be there 
Uh, and everybody in the audience, of course, laughed. It was a really funny joke to them and to him. Uh, I was even more infuriated than Without truth, there can be no justice. Without justice, there can be no peace. Without peace, there can be no evolution to be our natural selves as one people of an 8 billion plus family coexisting here on earth. According to Brown University, the war since 2001, including contingency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, cost more than $8 trillion, including healthcare costs for veterans through the year 2052. The war cost each American taxpayer $41,936. In 1960, the defense budget was $47,350,000,000. In 1970, it rose to $83,400,000,000. 10 million. 1980, it rose to 143 billion, 690 million. In 1990, our de the defense budget was 325 billion, 130 million. In 2000, it was 320 billion. In 2010, it was 738 billion. In 2020, it was 778 billion, 400 million. In 2021, it was 800 billion, 670 yeah. million. And in 2023, it was $877 billion of your hard earned money to defense. This is Richard Clark's quote when he was interviewed by Democracy Now! He's a United States uh, counterterrorism official in the Bush administration. He said, quote, in my mind, at least, it's clear that some of the things they did were war crimes. In Marbury versus Madison, Chief Justice John Marshall wrote, the government of the United States has been emphatically termed a government of laws, not of men. We the people have rights and fundamental to these is due process to the law. Nelson Mandela uh, condemned the United States plans to invade Iraq at a uh, talk he gave where he said this, the first world war was from 1914 to 1918. Then the second war took place 21 years later from 1939 to 1945. The third world war has not occurred as yet. It is 57 years since the last world war. There has been no war that is because of the United Nations, which is there to ensure that all countries that have differences should bring those differences to the United Nations to be resolved collectively. And that is why we have had no war for the last 57 years. If the United Nations says Saddam Hussein is not carrying out the resolutions of the United Nations, therefore we, the UN, are going to take action, I will support that without reservation. What I am condemning, what I'm condemning in that one power with a president who has no foresight, who cannot think properly, is now wanting to plunge the world into a Holocaust. I'm happy that the people of the world, especially those of the United States of America, are standing up and opposing their own president. I hope that the opposition will one day make him understand that he has made the greatest mistake of his life in trying to bring about carnage and to police the world without any authority from the international body. It is something we have to condemn without reservation. And the women at this forum are there to look into these things, to be bold with their leadership and to condemn what is wrong. And finally, we have, of course, the question of globalization. Wait, no. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, former chief of staff for Secretary of State Colin Powell said this, what really sort of got my attention was the way in which he characterized it in his memoir, In My Time. It's going to cause heads to explode, quote, was in the memoir. That's quite a visual, 
Wilkerson says. And in fact, it's the kind of headline I would expect to come out of a gossip columnist or the kind of headline you might see one of the supermarket tabloids write. It's not the kind of headline I would have expected to come from a former vice president of the United States. I think he's trying to, one, assert himself so he's not in some subsequent time period tried for war crimes. And second, so that he somehow vindicates himself because he feels like he needs vindication. That in itself tells you something about him. He's developed an angst and almost a protective cover, and now he fears being tried as a war criminal, so he uses such terminology as exploding heads all over Washington because that's the way someone who's decided he's not going to be prosecuted acts boldly. Let's get out in front of everybody. Let's act like we are not concerned and so forth when in fact they are covering up their own fear that somebody will Pinochet him. Former Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet was arrested for war crimes. So that's what he's referring to. Twenty thirteen, uh, the U.S. Attorney General stated that drone strikes on Americans are possible. If banks complicit in the financial crisis, in which fifteen trillion dollars of waste, fraud, and abuse happened through their malfeasance of the financial services industry, are too big to prosecute, too big to fail, essentially. And the question was asked, does the president claim the power to authorize lethal force such as drone strikes against a US citizen on US soil and without trial? The attorney general at that time in 2013 wrote that speaking hypothetically, it is possible to imagine an extraordinary circumstance in which that power might become necessary and appropriate. So are we a government? of laws, and if we aren't, then are people who are in the government able to do anything they want? That's the question we're asking this evening. And the, our demand to join the International Criminal Court now. On May 1st, 2005, the United Kingdom document known as the Downing Street Memo detailed the minutes of a meeting in July of 2002 which apparently leaked. The memo recorded the head of the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, is expressing the view following his recent visit to Washington that George W. Bush wanted to remove Saddam through military action, justified by the conjunction of terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. And this is the really interesting part that you all should remember. But the intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. It also quoted Secretary of State, Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, the British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw saying that it was clear that Bush had made up his mind to take military action, but that the case was thin and the Attorney General Goldsmith was warning that justifying the invasion on legal grounds would be difficult. The Downing Street memo is relevant to the question of the legality of the 2003 US invasion of Iraq because it discusses some legal theories that were considered prior to the invasion. In 2004, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan stated, I have indicated it was not in conformity with the United Nations Charter from our point of view and the United Nations Charter point of view, the war was illegal. United Nations Charter is the foundation of international law. A reporter, Sidney Schamberg, the opening scene from the film War Made Easy, which you can uh, find uh, online at the uh, World Beyond War website, said this. We Americans are the ultimate innocents. We are forever desperate to believe that this time the government is telling us the truth. Sidney Chamber. Uh, true that.
carved in stone above the doorstep of the Supreme Court of the United States is equal justice under law and inscribed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is all are equal before the law. Section 2441 of Chapter 118 of the U.S. Code, which is the codification of the general and permanent laws of the United States, relates to war crimes. It applies to U.S. national acts committed inside or outside the United States. War crimes are a grave breach in any of the international conventions signed at Geneva, 12th of August, 1949, or any protocol to such convention to which the United States is a party. The U.S. is a signatory to the Geneva Convention and the 1949 Hague Convention, which similarly prohibits war crimes such as wanton acts on a civilian population. The supremacy clause of the United States Constitution, Article 6, Clause 2, mandates that laws passed as well as treaties signed by the United States government constitutes the supreme law of the land. Anyone's curious uh, to read uh, that entire text? I, I uh, have a copy for anyone who would like to read that entire text. It's right here. Let's see what those specifically are. There's a known legal argument that the United States Constitution does not shield the president from being prosecuted for a crime while in office. According to this view, there is immunity. There is no immunity for presidents, thus proving that no one is above the law. A former president can be indicted for crimes that occurred when they were in office. President Gerald Ford was mindful of this when he granted, and listen to this, this bears remembering, a full, quote, a full, free, and absolute pardon onto Richard Nixon for all offenses against the United States, which he, Richard Nixon, has committed, and here's the part that should really make you start to go, things that make you go, hmm, from the highest level of power on earth, the most powerful country, or may have committed. So what does that tell you? Any, any guesses of what that tells you, or may have committed? He's fully pardoned for things they haven't even found out yet. So anything, right? They're sending a trial balloon out there to normalize presidents being able to do whatever they want and seeing if the public accepts it or peacefully and democratically mass mobilizes to protest presidents committing violations of the law, sometimes the gravest violations you can. Can a president pardon themselves for their crime? Anybody care to guess? Yeah. No. How yeah. many hands think the president cannot pardon themselves for a crime. Hands up if you think the president cannot pardon themselves for a crime. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many people think the president of the United States does have the power to pardon himself or herself for a crime when they commit? One, two, three. Okay, okay, for, for a shot we have, that's pretty close. Uh, but the days have it. Uh, the Constitution clearly states that no one is above the law. So the Please mute yourself. Who's ever making noise? Mute. Now, impeachment is a political, not a legal process. Uh, impeachment of a president can be for acts of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. A majority in the House of Representatives must vote for impeachment, then the Senate holds a trial, and if two-thirds of the Senate agree the president is guilty, then the president is removed from office. That's impeachment. Now, that's a political process that doesn't deal with the legal aspects of the crimes committed, so that's important to bear in mind. Two-thirds of the Senate. That's correct. That's the problem. That's the problem. Sit down ahead. A Pew Research Center, thank you very much. I, I encourage audience participation. So if anybody has a question, question answer session with Jonathan speaks as always. It's never a wrong question or a wrong time to ask the question. As long as you do it respectfully, politely, you know your question ahead of time, it's good to write it down. So okay, let's wait till question time though, Jonathan. Let's wait for the Pew Research Center survey of veterans in 2019 asked veterans, 
Was the war in Iraq worth fighting? 64% of United States veterans that are on the record, so it might be even a higher number because sometimes if you're still in certain positions of your service, you might not want to reveal how you feel about this until you're done with your military service. 64% of veterans said the war in Iraq was not worth fighting. 62 to 63% of all United States citizens said the Iraq war was not worth fighting. 58% of veterans said the war in Afghanistan was not worth fighting, and that was equal to all citizens of the United States saying it was not worth fighting. And 55% of veterans said the U.S. military campaign in Syria was not worth fighting, and that was even higher with the United States population. The source of that is surveys of U.S. veterans conducted in 2019 and U.S. adults conducted in 2019 by the Pew Research Center. 70% say that Congress should pass legislation that would strain military action overseas in three specific ways. Number one, the people in the United States said, 70% of people polled in the nation.com poll by requiring clearly defined goals to authorize military engagement. 78% said they were in favor of that. Number two, by requiring Congress to have both oversight and accountability regarding where troops are stationed. 77% of people in the United States were in favor of that. And number three, by requiring that any donation of funds or equipment to a foreign country be matched by a pledge of that country to adhere to the rules of the Geneva Convention. 85% of Americans support is that. Americans who support restraining military action overseas. Majority of Americans support restraining our military action, reducing our military presence overseas, bringing troops home, reduce the cost of militarism, reduce the number of bases. We don't have to police the world. The world needs to organize in peace the world instead of blow it up to police it. The best way you police it is to give everybody a job. So any, Police officer will tell you that. The number one way to reduce crime in your community is make sure you have employment, especially manufacturing employment that is paying people a living wage. And good education, good health care, affordable housing, et cetera. Retirement with dignity, disability services, et cetera. The poll brings home just how divorced the Beltway in Washington, D.C. and the think tanks, media outlets, and political class is from the express desire of a large majority of Americans for a responsible, reasonable foreign policy policy that arguably has been absent since the end of the Cold War, writes James Carden. In 20, 2022, the president's job approval, people disapproved of the president's uh, time in office, 56% of Americans. Americans were pulled should the United States send troops to Ukraine in 2022? 71% of we the people of the United States said no. Committee for Responsible Foreign Policy in November 2017 survey taken by John Wallen Opinion Research said that 86.4% of Americans said that US military should be used only as a last resort. 58% of Americans said military aid to foreign countries is counterproductive. 2018, Americans were not convinced the U.S. needs to spend more on defense. The Gallup poll showed that the majority say military is currently strong enough. Although the new federal budget significantly increases U.S. defense spending, only a third of Americans believe the government needs to spend more. The majority of Americans, as we have for many years, believe the government is spending too much on defense and not enough on needs here at home. And to help veterans of former wars receive all the services and programs they need and become members of the community again. Welcome back, our brothers and sisters who have served and serve in military service and other ways.
Politicians don't want to be in a position of being prosecuted for waging war. That's one reason there are undeclared wars. What are some of the ways you hear in the news sometimes that undeclared wars are termed? What are some of the words they use that they name them? Anybody have any guesses? Police action. Because that then sets in our minds that we are the ones who decide in Washington, D.C., being we, not we the people, uh, who the good guys and who the bad guys are, what the crimes are that are violated, most serious, and how to respond to that, of course, is what? Smash them to smithereens. Right? Fighting, fighting extremism anywhere in the world to protect your children from the terrorism that's about to come into your house in the middle of the night and take all your belongings and uh, uh, eat your brain out of you while you're watching them do it. You know, the most horror movie of all time horror movies right there on mainstream news. Uh, we're, we're liberating because we're feminists in Washington, D.C. We care so much about equality on it, correct? Anybody else? War on communism? Yes, they're fighting against totalitarianism and protecting your precious little children from being infected by something that we have outright rejected forever because we love democracy and we don't want to go to extremes like fascism or communism or any other ex uh, extinctionism you can think of. Conflicts, they're called, police actions, humanitarian interventions, uh, saving us from totalitarianism, enforcing sanctions, operations. In addition, the public is not told about some wars at all as they are conducted covertly with secret budgets. One of the greatest joys of this talk was doing the research and finding out about a Chicago hero of justice. Quiet, please. No, that's all right. Let the audience be quiet, please. Charlie, that Don't just worry, I've got a booming voice. They can hear me in Iowa, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Kentucky. Uh, one of our heroes of justice, of the rights of everyday people, especially during wartime, to express dissent against Washington, D.C.'s uh, ill thought, ill spent, uh, crazy lunacy uh, ideas, was uh, this gentleman. Salmon Oliver Levinson. And I'd like to tell you about a Chicago uh, native son who we should all uh, tell our families and our neighbors about and uh, be proud of. Pass that around. Salmon Levinson, he assisted in drafting the Kellogg Grand Pact, which was the renunciation of war, which was originally ratified by 15 countries in 1928, and a total of 62 nations eventually agreed to it to not use war to resolve international conflict. The pact is a predecessor for the eventual United Nations Charter. Uh, he was active in the international peace movement, and he said this, we should have not as now laws of war, but laws against war, just as there are no laws of murder, no laws of poisoning, but laws against them. The treaty was the first international agreement to make war illegal. Love this guy. The treaty commits the parties to condemn recourse to war for the solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy and agree that all disputes should be settled peacefully. Uh, he's the author of the book Outlawry of War, which was published in 1921. He became a proponent. Uh, He's also author of Aggression International for Encyclopedia of Social Sciences. He worked closely with uh, the legendary uh, organizer Jane Adams on philanthropic efforts in Chicago, including financial support for refugees who were coming to the United States from Europe during the rise 
of extremism and to the form of fascism in the 1930s. Uh, there's a book written by Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro that you should get called The Internationalist, How a Radical Plan to Outlaw War Remade the World. He established the Levinson Prize for Poetry Magazine, which I love, which is still administered today. Uh, started, he established the William Edgar Bora Outlawry of War Foundation at the University of Idaho in 1929. There's a grant from Levinson then of $50,000, which $50,000 in 1929, uh, you do the math, that's a lot more today's dollars. In 1931, he won the Rosenberger Medal for his work in international relations from the University of Chicago. He urged the United States entry into the World Court in 1925, and in 1927, he presented the Levinson Plan, which called for the readjusting of German reparations and allied and inter-allied debts and world peace. He was twice proposed for the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1934, he was decorated with the French Legion of Honor. Uh, he was able to uh, give back so much of his earnings because he was a successful lawyer who reorganized the personal and professional uh, economic affairs of industrial tycoon George Washington, or George Westinghouse, sorry. What the world now needs is enlightenment and a concentration on moral forces, is written in Levinson's Outlawry of War. The goodwill and good faith of the peoples of the world expressing the common purpose and judgment through law. Attempts to render war less cruel or savage by formulating so-called laws of war and to provide for its conduct humanely are food to the He's gods for laughter. You cannot feed tigers on oranges, but to formulate and codify laws, rules, and decisions which shall outlaw aggressive war and declare it to be the chief of crimes and thereby prevent it ought not to be a hopeless endeavor. Such a noble effort Mr. Levinson is trying to foster, wrote Judge Edward O. Brown and John Dewey in Outlawry of War. Milestone of progress in the moral code of humankind. The people of the world want war unmasked and declared an international law to be what it is, in fact, the supreme enemy of we, the human race. People of the world want the conscience of humans everywhere to think of war not as an honorable profession, not as the path to glory and power, but as the arch murderer yeah. of the youth of the human race, the master assassin of motherhood and the home. The people of the world want war revealed as the paralysis of production and the suicide of commerce, the betrayal of brotherhood and sisterhood, the poison in the cup of good, will between the nations of the earth, the forerunner of pestilence and famine, spreading ruin and desolation alike among the victors and the vanquished. The people of the world want war outlawed as a crime against the law of nations and the life of humanity. The people of the world want militarists branded as super felons among the criminals of the earth. Creation and codification of international law in the outlaw area of war is as follows. Number one, abolish the further use of war. Number two, declare war to be a public crime. Number three, define war, preserve the right of defense against attack, all annexations or exactions or seizures by force, through duress, or fraud shall be null and void. Number five, create an international court. Six, all nations shall agree to abide and be bound by and in good faith to carry out the orders, decrees, and decisions of such court. One nation cannot summon another before the international court except in respect to a matter of international and common concern. Number eight, the court should sit in the hemisphere of the contending nations or the hemisphere of the defendant nation. Number nine, national weapons to be reduced to the lowest point. Number 10, abolition of professional militaries and substitution of a potential military through citizen soldiery. I've never heard this concept before. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about it this evening during the rebuttals in the Q&A session. Number 11, all nations shall make public report once each year all of their weapons. Number 12, the doctrines of military necessity, retaliation, and reprisal 
which are open to such flagrant and abhorrent abuse shall be eliminated. Relieve the world of the destructive incubus of war, eliminate aggression, fraud. It would rob the profession of killing of its glory and prestige. It would outlaw war by making it a public crime. What's the name of that document? Outlawry of War by Salmon Oliver Levinson. Law and courts supplant methods of violence and force. War is inhumane. We want no laws of war, but laws against war, as we have laws against murder and laws against burglary. We want the reduction of weapons. We want no fewer wars, but no wars. No less destruction wars, but no wars at all. Limitation of armaments is not enough. We have nobly abolished the institutions of dueling, abolished the institutions of slavery, why not abolish the institution of war? Seems like an excellent question to me, and this is 100 years ago. Creating an international court is important. That's our priority, national honor and vital interest to justify and fortify war. Remove the causes of war and the causes of weapons should be our goal. Usher in an era of the brotherhood and sisterhood of humans. It is this legal device of violence that must be removed. For the remedy of war has now become always worse than the disease. We should codify international law to outlaw war, make war illegal and criminal, create a real court, prepare the code of law by leading states, people, and jurists of the world. The expense of paying for the court will be far less than the cost of any war. The international court must be given adequate power to enforce its judgment against all war criminals. The branding of militarists as criminals, what he wrote about. Crystallized international public opinion in favor of peace. Each nation shall disclose once a year the full nature of its weapons. The outlawry of war is not intended as a panacea. It seeks to apply the tried and effective methods of civilization to international relations. It seeks to put a final end to the theory of force and the theory of violence for the termination of right in any human dispute. It does not claim that it will usher in an era of brotherly love, nor create a United States of the world. It merely seeks to abolish the worst form of violence and the worst form of crime existing among humans. Salmon O. Levinson, Chicago, Illinois. Salmon Oliver Levinson. Let's get a hand.
Okay, uh, for all the people who just came back on Zoom, uh, we're just telling people you have a people's ballot this evening. We'll announce at the end of the program. The question is, in your opinion, which ruling class of what country most represents all the unique qualities of a Dummer Azel? And we'll present uh, the ruling class that you, the people of the College of Complexes, decide this evening uh, to receive be the recipient of the 2023 Dummer Azel Award. Tonight's question number two. There are two questions on tonight's ballot. Question number two is as follows. Do you support the United States acceding to the Rome Statute and ramification of the Rome Statute to officially join the International Criminal Court, agreeing to be a member of the state's parties who are within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? You can vote yes, no, or I am undecided. Uh, I still have to tell you exactly what the Rome Statute is, but I guarantee you, if you like what Samuel Levinson said, it's even better. Uh, thank you all for making your voices heard. We'll announce the results at the end of the program. The Dumber Easel Award is the registered trademark of the Planet Over Profit Academy. Yeah. It means distinguished elder, correct. It's, 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 I think it's uh, Dutch uh, Bohemian. It's, it's an old, old world. As Donna Rothfeld used to say, old Europe. Uh, it's, it it's an old Europe, Europe translation of Dutch. It means Dutch. Well, um, man. okay, well, you... that's quite an honor. Well, we're still going to have to, we already let the people vote, so we're going to have to get somebody that recipient of that <laughs> But some people actually like to be degraded. Okay. You know, people like uh, sadomasochism in okay. Washington, D.C., especially, so maybe they'll like that sort of thing. All right. Uh, it would have been New, new Europe, because when Ron still talked about it, okay. he referred to the East Block. New, New Europe and the West being called Europe. Okay, Jonathan, are we are we done with the formal presentation now? No, uh, not yet. Okay. Repeat that, sir. When Donald Give us a bumper sticker on what you just said. I like referred to the former East Block as New Europe and the West is Old Europe. So it would actually have been New Europe. Okay. So uh, Washington, D.C. decides uh, who's relevant and who is amongst. 95% of we the people of Earth. Well, that sounds pretty good. Frederick Douglass said in August of 1857, the whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her August claims have been born of earnest struggle. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are those who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Albert Einstein said this, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. The mediocre mind is incapable of understanding the ones who refuse to bow cowardly to conventional prejudices and choose instead to express our opinions courageously and honestly. Does anybody like documentaries? Yes. Especially documentaries yeah. where uh, they talk about civics as regards to uh, uh, movement politics and ordinary everyday people's voices being heard first instead of either last or never. And there's a great film that just came out. It's called Ithaca, a father, a family, a fight for justice. And uh, if you could pass that around so we can see how we're each you What's our time right now? It's just six, up, six seventeen. I'd like you to wrap up in about five or ten minutes. Okay. Jake, we're going to be about five or six more minutes. Julian Assange get you. is an Australian editor, publisher, and activist who founded WikiLeaks in two thousand six. Julian came to international attention in 2010 when WikiLeaks published a series of leaks provided by U.S. Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning, including leaks that showed war crimes committed with the knowledge of the U.S. government. After the 2010 leaks, the United States government launched a criminal investigation into WikiLeaks and are now seeking his extradition to prosecute him in the U.S. Uh, he is currently held in HMP Belmarsh Prison in London. Uh, I just want to ask a poll of everybody here. Do you support the release of Julian Assange immediately? 
Do you support a truly free press on Earth? Do you support protections for journalists from political pros prosecution? Do you support a robust democracy? Do you support the exposure and prosecution of war crimes? And will you stand up for these issues or join in organizing for these issues? Jonathan, we met, we went to see that movie here in Chicago and met Juliana Sass's father. Did you enjoy it? Yes. It was, it was uh, a film that told you a lot of things that you don't hear on the uh, big names, which I won't mention. Those, yes. those, those sources of information and know everything and no questioning is needed anymore. It's the end of history. So uh, it revealed some things that otherwise you won't know. So our, our, our media kind of is not doing their job. Yeah, F minus. Why should we join the Rome Statute? Joining the Rome Statute is an expression of solidarity with the victims. Victims have the right to participate in the proceedings before the court through a legal representative. State parties to the Rome Statute have established a trust fund for victims, an independent institution through which victims and their families can receive assistance and reparations, including restitution, compensation, and rehabilitation. Joining the Rome Statute is a powerful foreign policy statement. States, parties, and the international community continue to reaffirm their commitment to the ICC. Ratifying or acceding to the Rome Statute shows commitment to international law and peace and security and strengthens the resolve of multilateral diplomacy. Joining the Rome Statute contributes to the prevention and deterrence of future war crimes. Through its preliminary examinations, investigations, and judicial processes, the ICC's work can help prevent future crimes from happening by putting potential perpetrators on notice that anyone may be held responsible if they commit poor international crimes. Joining the Rome Statute reinforces the equality of all before the law. The Rome Statute sets one standard for all. No one is below or above the law. As official capacity is irrelevant under the Rome Statute, all individuals can be brought to justice for grave international crimes. Stanley Butler wrote a book called War is a Racket. And uh, I found out about uh, Smedley through this bookstore called the New World Resource Center which was near this bowling alley in Chicago that I used to go to to hear live music for like four to five bucks. And uh, I've heard many of you speak about Smedley before here at the college and I'm so proud that uh, we can remind people that it's not all Cheney and Rumsfeld's and uh, Powell's and Bush's in uh, the world. There are some people who do know that you sometimes have to defend democracy and the honor of we the people and the principles through uh, after diplomacy has failed through the use of self-defense, which is justified war. Uh, and Smedley was, uh, of course, never elected president of the United States for that very reason, because what does reducing war not make? Ding, 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 ding. Doesn't make any profits. So Smedley was beloved by we the people majority of Americans, and they were scared to death in, in Wall Street, Washington, D.C. Smedley? Okay, now a lot of people say, well, how are you going to do this? How are you going to get the United States government joined the Rome Statute to be a member of the International Criminal Court. Who's ever chewing? Mute your mic. In protest, yeah. speaking engagements, he, he needs to get the public mic. appearances, and fundraising events. They can refuse to vote for candidates if they are not on record as proponents of the U.S. joining the Rome Statute. Can you hear my 
and I know that I used I used to be a lead singer in a punk rock band. I know you guys can hear me even without this. Refusal to vote for candidates unless they use all of their power to conduct arrests of war criminal suspects who are within the U.S. That's another way we could peacefully Democrat. Don't shop at or support businesses or organizations and suspects who work on their owners of, members of, or have financial interest and or investments in. Have art fundraisers, festivals, other cultural Jake, events. Hey, 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 Jake, I'm going to mute you until we're done. Okay, all right. Talk to that gentleman and that gentle lady right there, the two of the best organizers I know about exactly that last point. You can protest educational institutions where suspects are employed, granted with awards, honorary degrees, or keynote speaker appearances. You can plan a day when the whole country is encouraged to voice support for the U.S. joining the Rome Statute. August 27th would be one day. That's the anniversary of the Kellogg Brian reannunciation of the War Pact that was signed, that was the brainchild of Samuel Levinson, but these big leaks in government and other places of VIP state Kellogg and Brian and Really interesting. Samuel Oliver Levinson. <laughs> or September 21st, also the United States International Day of Peace. That would also be another good day uh, to do it. Declare and join the Rome Statute now, or we the people will refuse to pay our taxes campaign. Organize to revoke suspects' right to travel internationally and domestically. Amnesty International has already done this for George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. They can't travel out of the country easily. Uh, Unless, I don't know, they do something crazy from some Hollywood science fiction film like clone them or something. I don't know. They refuse to purchase products from all companies that advertise on media shows reports that fail to begin their broadcast with war criminal suspects when they or their name appears during the show. Send local newspapers and newsletters articles about the suspects' war crimes and why they should appear before the International Criminal Court. Speak on radio, television, podcasts, and at free speech forums to tell the public about and discuss the advantages of the U.S. joining the Rome Statute and why it represents the United people's values. Speak to local civil society groups and nonprofit organizations, schools, labor groups. Law student groups, bookstores, libraries, human rights organizations, peace groups, and faith organizations. Build alliances amongst every single person you can find. It takes all of us to make peace happen. Have radical solidarity. Place yeah. house parties and discussion groups to raise awareness about the International Criminal Court and the opportunity we have to pressure the government to charge the suspects of war crimes in a domestic court. Take an online course at the Hague Academy for International Law. <laughs> conduct sit-in strikes to protest the U.S. Department of Justice until they arrest the war criminal suspects and conduct trials. Plan educational trips to visit the Netherlands. Expensive, so I can't do that. But please. People watching us on the web, we know that you guys have money. So go to the Netherlands, do a research project, come back and give a talk at College of Complex. I'll be in the front row. I'll get there two hours early. Two hours late in the afternoon. Learn more about the work and the community. Put a We Support Joining the ICC poster in your window or in your door, or a bumper sticker, a t shirt, hat. Have a constitutional convention. It's kind of controversial with some people, but I don't think so. You need to have a constitutional convention every 20 or 30 years, said many of the people who founded this country. The purpose of holding a national discussion about what we should improve in the country so that the laws fully reflect our values and meet today's needs in order to enforce actions of justice that the government has in the past failed to commit to when the gravest crimes have been conducted by powerful people. And the last one that I suggest is uh, like a block party. We all love to go to Soldier Field for, uh, you know, they have a, a, a party to celebrate uh, us all being together on Earth. Football is an excuse to do that one way, but there's many other ways. Peace 
peacefully, nice small wise. I said peacefully again. So people who love to tell us that we're crazy maniacs, don't forget that I said the word peacefully in the beginning three times. Mobilize a of the people, by the people, for the people, general strike. So you can bring your kids, your grandkids, your parents, your grandparents, lots of water, snacks, chairs, canopies, umbrellas, lots of fully accessible fortified. I apologize for dinner to talk about that, but let's be real. That's what I do 24 7 in independent living advocacy for how to do this. Right. So, Diana, declare our mass refusal to return to our jobs. That's indefinitely. Demand that all public officials resign immediately. Conduct a We the People Only Nationwide Assembly to join the International Criminal Court. We don't need to ask our government to do things that reflect our principles in the upper 80 percentile. If they don't do immediately fast track uh, legislation, the, the 70 percentile or 80 percentile of 330 million Americans support, we can go without the government because that is the definition of treason. They're ignoring your voices and my voices from doing something that doesn't take any technology or lots of money or new innovation in any way. It's just saying that we agree to act like civil 21st century human beings and be a good neighbor of all our other buildings. It's a very, very basic, most uncontroversial bill. And as usual, Washington is one of those super uncontroversial bills. So I can tell you more about that, what he advocates for. Dr. Clark can ask you questions about uh, on your Freedom Act, he'll tell you all about how Washington suddenly finds a reason not to do the most logical thing on earth. So, uh, what I propose is very simple. Uh, your government does not represent your values. Your government does not represent your voices. Your government does not represent your heart and your soul of what you want the world to be so that there can be a world in the future for people. So I'm suggesting a peaceful, peaceful mass mobilization of we the people of the United States for what I have tentatively termed, I don't take credit for the word, I'm sure somebody else came up with it. They just happen to not be a big a ham as I am, like you come to the college of complex obsessively and talk to people about civics until three in the morning. But we the people evolution now. Now I don't think that's out of order. That's pretty much uh, in line with our values, with uh, who we are as Americans, and uh, I'd like to uh, read a quote by uh, someone that is pretty uncontroversial as uh, people in history across the world. Hey, okay, Jonathan, you got to start wrapping up with your buddy. Okay. Go, 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 go. <laughs> goodness, goodness, goodness. Don't go to your library, it'll make you read. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I didn't memorize this. It's kind of embarrassing because I get to talk about this stuff. Henry David Thoreau said this in Civil Disobedience. I'll, I'll paraphrase. The state never intentionally confronts a human sense, intellectual or moral, but only one's body, one's senses. It is not armed with superior wit or honesty, but with superior physical strength. We, the people, were not born to be forced. We will breathe after our own fashion. Let us see who is the strongest. Uh, thank you very much for being
being here this evening. That's my talk. All right. Yeah. Let's, Jonathan, stay up there. We're going to have questions. Yeah. Okay, Jake, you have had your hand up. Unmute and ask your question. Okay, Jake, you're ready. Hi, T. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jake. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I sorry I came in a little late. I first I forget I, I didn't catch your name and affiliation. Jonathan, this is a Q and A session. Jake, ask questions. He asked your name. I did. I did. I did. He's on a phone, uh, Jonathan. Hello. He see. He sees you. Name okay. and affiliation, Jonathan. He just wants to know your name. I don't know. Hello. I can't hear you. He hasn't said anything yet. Go ahead, Jonathan. What's your name? Jonathan's name is Jonathan, Jake. Okay. And what, what's your affiliation? I'm a free-minded earthling carbon-based life form since 1972. What? Yeah, that's well, correct. Free-minded uh, human being, uh, earthling carbon-based life form since 1972. Okay. Uh, second question. You, you, um, you, you you said this. What was his name? John, Jonathan um, 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 Levinson. What was his name? Samuel. Sam Levinson. Sam Samuel Levinson. Right. He's proposing that we outlaw outlaw war. How do you do that? I mean, how how do you enforce that? You behave as a civil, principled, peaceful, kind neighbor to your other human being, global neighbors. It's actually well, but, all over the world by the majority of human beings, especially children. When you see children who have to share or uh, children who have to uh, have space together where they coexist in, no matter what language they are, what race they are, what religion they are, what economic background they are, what country they come from, uh, they show us that peacefulness is our natural state. War is an abomination and it's a fiction and it has no place in a civilized society, especially in the 21st century, when there's so many nuclear uh, warheads in every uh, country's disposal, which I don't think our natural state is to be suicidal psychopaths. I think it's to be neighbors who uh, like being neighbors because it's fun to be neighbors. Okay, Charlie, I'm you're sorry next. I'm to give you the peanut butter and jelly answer, Jake, but it's pretty, uh, it's existed since the beginning of time, every prophet and every religion or non-religious okay. religions have talked about. All right, Charlie, you're next. Yes, Jonathan. Um, when you make a presentation, I always say you have to avoid internal contradictions. You preach an awful lot of isolationism. Define, but how do you adopt anything define, called international define, law? Define isolationism. And I don't know how you plan on enforcing international law unless you have an army and you send it overseas. Exactly, exactly. What do you, what do you just notify someone that they have violated international law? Write up, uh, send, call them up and say, hey, you violated international law. He goes, oh, I did? I didn't know that. So you're basically saying that people who are powerful and rich and influential are uh, not possible to prosecute. People who are working class and middle class are. Is that what you're arguing? I'd like to know how you plan on enforcing the law that you're claiming exists. With all the uh, money and power and personnel that we've put into law enforcement in the history of this country, it'd be the easiest thing in the world to have every uh, person who we de people deem guilty of war crimes brought before either a domestic or international court tomorrow. Oh, who's going to do it? And uh, the United States Justice has a budget for this. They actually say that we should uh, allocate uh, huge amounts of money to uh, counter terrorism. So if you agree with the majority of people on earth that state uh, aggression, war of aggression is state terrorism, then that bears to reason the right of the citizenry to demand that the money that they send to their government for enforcement through the Department of Justice, it's called in this part of the world, uh, arrest those people, stat. 
because if you don't arrest them, you set a precedent where current people in power can do even worse things, which, uh, you know, you really have to be strict on these guys in Washington, D.C. You cannot give them one out until daylight. Because if one president gets away with two wars at the same time, another one can get away with 20 wars at the same time. Another one can get away with 200 wars at the same time. You have to let them know that they work for us. We don't work for them. That's not isolationism. That's grassroots democracy. Uh, okay, Jonathan, I got a question for you. How would you stop a man like Vladimir Putin right now under your system? Well, I'm here this evening because I was born in the United States. I love the United States. I think it's the best country to live in. I don't think it's a perfect country by far, but uh, I'm cleaning up my backyard tonight. And you're welcome to invite anybody uh, on earth to speak at the college and complexes about countries that they live in. I would be proud and honored of this uh, free speech forum to have a Russian, or an Iraqi, or a Palestinian, or a Syrian, or a Yemenis, or a Somalian, or an Afghani, or a Pakistani, or a Honduran, or a Cuban, or a Chinese, or any person talk about how they have to deal with their ruling class like we have to rule with our ruling class. I'm not here to criticize countries that I've never been to, I wasn't born in, I don't live in. I'm here to say we need to clean up our own backyard. Okay, good, good reply. Dan, you had a question online? You had your hand up, Dan? Okay, we'll take questions. All right. Yeah, Dan. I got a question. All right, we'll go, Dan, go ahead. Uh, no. Yeah, okay. Um, Jonathan, good speech. What do you, what do you say? Are you saying that, that, uh, like the Chicago police should go arrest George W. Bush? If because people have a, a conducted an investigation that is uh, democratic and fair in nature and determined that they have crossed the line of those crimes, yes. Okay, thank you. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, this is not a difficult uh, topic. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, trying to get around any questions. I'm head on saying yes. We have the most expensive, uh, well-trained employee <coughs> staff. They've got all the bells and whistles of tools that they need of listening to everything we do, watching everything we do, checking our movements, checking our phones, checking our computers. You all know this. We've heard talk and talk and talk in college and complexes about this. We're not a democracy. We're in a surveillance society. If anything, it behooves us all to go on nationwide peaceful democratic strike because they know, they openly say it, that he's afraid that we're going to come to fill in your blank town, USA, and uh, conduct either a, an official Department of Justice arrest, a local sheriff's arrest, or we the people, peaceful democratic citizens arrest, not because we are got a political axe to grind, because our principles were not represented to them and they violated the most serious laws in history. Okay, uh, Ellen, you got the next question. Go ahead, please. Right, yeah, Jonathan, I'm trying, I loved your talk, but, and I don't understand, you know, I have a lot of theories why your logic has not been able to prevail. Well, it did, it prevailed in overwhelming numbers with we the people. Uh, we live in a country where Washington, D.C., says that they care about you and I and our communities and your community and my community. And they're so uh, dedicated to doing the right thing to improve quality of life of your community and my community. And then when the speech is over and they're away from the microphone. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're hypocrites. They, and, uh, <laughs> they lie. They're... And then when the speech is over, they go talk to the lobbyists and they go talk to the people who want to give them big campaign contributions. They do the exact opposite. Right. So uh, we live in a country of a criminal government. Yeah. And uh, the great thing is we do like block parties. We do love justice and we do love our neighbors. So let's peacefully and democratically take necessary action stat because uh, the future of the planet might change on that. What do you think? Why was the Treaty of Rome? I the Rome they, Statute, yes. The Rome Statute. Why can't we join that? Why can't we? Uh... Well, we the people can't. 
we don't need our governments to do things for us. They work for us. So when someone works for you and they say no for uh, centuries, uh, you need to peacefully and democratically not suggest it to them again, not recommend it to them again, not beg for it to happen, not uh, 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 lobby that. You need to peacefully and democratically take power, remove them because of their treasonous action from yeah, power, treason. and then that same people will be elected to have direct democracy, which was the original uh, thought behind the uh, Athenian uh, democracy advocates who wanted ordinary everyday people to be in power, not people who their whole lives were groomed to be yes men for the uh, profit and the wars and the eco side, okay. the special interests in the privatization, the corporatization. Well, let's people. move on. We've got a question in the back. I believe that the whole world, that Rome conference, we haven't joined it because we were always worried that it would construct the future from U.S. soldiers. Well, I haven't suggested anything about that prosecuting the U.S. soldiers today. No, I'm talking about the people of the ruling That yes. whole Rome conference would end up prosecuting. That was a legitimate argument against it, I believe. A legitimate argument on maybe the TV screen when I won't say their names are being broadcast. Um, my promise tonight is the ruling class has people who never fight the war. And, and those are the people who order the wars. And I'm focused on prosecuting them. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, abuse of our men and women in armed services when they were put in these unjust killing wars. And it was abuse. Uh, if you watch the movie Body of War, which is here available for you, see he talks about Thomas Young. And also, if you read one of those green books, it has all the information that you can read his last letter that he wrote to uh, Dick Cheney and George W. Bush, in which he pretty much laid out the premise of why we, the people, uh, need to claim sovereignty from the people who hijacked our country, warm us, and then act like we wanted them to do the things that we wanted when they did the exact opposite of what you and I would do on our own neighborhood. Let's say, for example, in your house, you spent so much money that the windows were bulging with weapons and you had no room to actually get in the house. And all the other neighbors had noticed that you had so many weapons that you had spent probably 90% of your budget on either weapons or just being ready for something that you needed that many weapons. People would be kind of alarmed that you weren't taking care of your own family and spending it on the madness of militarism. That's just one example. I could go to Ecoside, I could go to bailouts for Wall Street, different uh, topics. But if a government acts like that, suddenly it's legitimate and credible? No. Yeah. If it's not a credible thing for your neighbor to intimidate and threaten and scare people by uh, being armed to the teeth and constantly talking about antagonizing and provoking everyone in the community and scaring them into thinking that everyone is a potential threat to them. That's not okay for the people with money and power and influence to do it either. That's called no one is above the law. That's not controversial. We all agree to that. In principle, let's agree to it in practice. Okay. Uh, you must remember the power of yeah. a military industrial complex too. Well, I think originally Eisenhower called it the military industrial congressional complex. Yes, so there are articles about that that I read uh, that I think are in one of the green books too, where it talks about how Congress doesn't want to be the first Congress person to reduce their budget in their district because some fantasy that that's the only job available in the 21st century. We can't go back to manufacturing jobs like building uh, high-speed rail or more broadband or more affordable housing or power wheelchairs or power scooters or ramps or home modifications. Or, dignity when they retire and the disability can live with a high quality of life that the rest of us want or renewable energy. Uh, we all have already been told on this for decades. We want the troops to come back home and this endless uh, basis uh, madness and start to be a uh, neighbor again instead of a psychopath, sociopath nation. And we the people in every poll okay. said that. It's just Washington, D.C. hijacked your government, my government away from us. And that's why the 
it's so fun to talk about peaceful democratic mass mobilization because I love block parties. Okay. I love tailgate parties at Soldier Field. I can't afford to get into Soldier Field, but I love those tailgate parties outside because even working class people like me can uh, celebrate with right. ordinary everyday people our love of we the people of Earth. And whether Our you're a football fan or not. Arlington Park. Or, okay. or, or in Arlington Heights. You know, All right, wherever, puppy. wherever they play, wherever Justin uh, 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 runs to the end zone or throws to the end zone and the rest of the Bears uh, bring us another Super Bowl. Okay, I'm before I go back out. to Jake and Charlie again, is there anybody else in the... Uh, all right, go, um, go ahead and ask your question. My first question is, why are we still calling it the Department of Defense when it is actually the War Department? And, um, it sounds better. And why do we... Um, I don't remember the name of the team, but it's so good. George Patton saying, I love war. It is the most, it is the highest achievement of human beings or something like that. And it's the most wonderful activity on earth. And I wonder how you deal with that psychology of people who love war. Why you have a different psychology, and they might feel happier if they come around to your way of thinking and my way of thinking. Yeah. Um, I don't think that you can have, I don't think you can change that kind of a mindset. Yeah. Want the person. It, it, it starts, it starts in the moment. Yeah. That kind of mindset. I'm better than you are because of my color or because of my education. I got so much money. Uh, uh, Tom Hartman talked about this yesterday that, um, that the brain changes, having power and money changes. And so there has to be something. Please repeat the question. There has to be something absolutely fundamental to change the nature of people who think that militarism is a good thing and that diplomacy and peace and negotiation and being a good neighbor is somehow a weakness. Well, it, at the center of uh, World War II, they tried to hide that our president was a member of the disability community. It kind of relates to part of your question and the way I think about these issues. Uh, we haven't been honest to ourselves about what governments really do. We haven't been honest to ourselves what we expect them to do to accurately, precisely represent our values. Um, I think that to be a peaceful person, uh, you have to realize that in every person, there's a tug of war going on uh, between the ego and the soul, and the soul wins every single day because that's our natural state. Who tells us that that is not true? Doing, doing those things that make the most profit, okay. give them more power and more influence. The soul never loses to you if we're honestly looking at the scoreboard accurately without any middle person telling us profit. So uh, every day, when you live your lives, your soul has won that tug of war over the ego easily. When the football game would be like a thousand to nothing, and the team would have left at halftime because they were like, we don't want to get hurt anymore. All our players can't play in the game anymore. Uh, the soul won again, as it always takes to see. There's some people in Washington, D.C., and there's a lot of psycho psychological uh, thesis papers and studies on this. The psychopaths and sociopaths uh, actually brainwash themselves into group things. Ego, one over the soul, and there is no such thing as a society as Reagan and Thatcher. Uh, okay. There's the ego. There's the profit. There's the uh, uh, we have to be the big, strong caveman who pulled the bigger branch off the tree to fight the other caveman who had a smaller branch, and then we picked up a bigger rock and we threw it at the other caveman who couldn't pick up this bigger rock that we did, and then we come to the cave and we say. That's our identity. That's what makes us proud of who we are. That's just not true. So Washington, D.C., 
is really nonsense. It's actually, uh, for propofol on steroids is a little bit more. Yeah. Next. Cooper for propofol on steroids, DC, would be a wonderful new phrase we could give them until we have the diesel democratic message. Okay, Jake and then Charlie. Jake, go ahead. Well, yeah, I think these. Jake. So anybody who hasn't asked a question yet who's here present. All right, go ahead. Andy. All right, Andy, and then I'll get. Okay, we'll hold off. Andy, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can Jake, you hear me? Jake, we're going to. You weren't there, but we're going to get you. We're going to get you in a couple more because there's a couple more who haven't okay. had in the audience. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I'm listening, Andy. For murder, and that book laid out the whole history of the Question can't hear the question. Okay. Andy, could you just summarize the question one more time, really loud? I asked you that. Washington, D.C. have decided to use the law as in the 21st century, identifying the people who don't have power as either the criminals or the soon to be criminals, right? And they frame that argument in you're either with us or against us. And the lazy corporate media never asked anybody on the street because they never interview everyday people on the street. They certainly never interview people at grassroots organizing uh, meetings or nonprofits or labor unions or peace groups or free speech uh, forums. What we think about that because, uh, you know, the answer would be absolutely uh, clear. Uh, we're with either and against both. I'm against anyone who conducts state war of aggression, which is state terrorism, that's rich people suit and tie terrorism, or anyone who conducts a crime on the street to steal uh, money from a retiree who's walking home from the grocery store or the library or the local school concert and uh, somebody decided they were going to make it easy whatever's in the wallet, whatever's in the purse. So uh, we're with neither against both of you people of earth. And we just have to start to reaffirm that, to repeat that loudly in our actions and our mobilizing and to set new values in action, not just in thoughts, dreams, and words. Because when we set new values in action, uh, it's a beautiful thing, the things that we call locally uh, nationally and internationally for quality work. And okay. then we can start to actually deterring people who are psychopaths or sociopaths from wanting to go into positions of power in the okay. first place. The only people who then want to go into public office are like people who love their social studies class and love uh, going to their local nonprofit or faith organization or hanging out with their friends, learning to coexist and listening more than talking and sharing and making okay. sure the least of my uh, brothers and sisters is the person I most focus on because there shouldn't be any poverty in the world. There should be no lease. We should all be one big circle, not a ladder where there's a couple handful of people and then okay. the majority live in suffering all the time. Next That's question. how you get to the crux of your question. All right, go ahead. Oh, I heard Wait, one second. I sorry to interrupt. Andy asked a question. I want to quickly quote Smedley Butler for Andy. Okay. Uh, uh, book, uh, 
War is a profit. I'll get to you, Sophia, a one racket. second. War is a racket. A war, war, war is a racket, sorry. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service. And during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico and especially Tampa go safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the reaping of a half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in the early 1900s. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. Helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 27, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three districts of Chicago. I operated on three continents. That's Smedley Butler, one of my and your, I know, at the College of Conferences, founders of Real Democracy. Okay, next question here. I have no question. I heard that it was a study with that thing about you. That's a vacuum. Why do you want to laugh? And the beginning of your statement is, I heard. Tell me the sources that I, I probably heard that too. Where were those sources telling us to memorize that every second of the day, year after year after year for the last 20 years? What were the sources? Was it commercial uh, machine that's kind of this shape and there are people on it? Tell you that they care about you and they want you to be happy and they want you to have a good life and they want you to have a good life and you to have a good life and you to have you know what the secret is to having a good life? Watching them tell you every day a thing going on earth is propaganda. That's what makes me happy. I love propaganda. I can't get enough of it. I wish they would tell us over and over again how all the manufacturing jobs left and magically made my life better. Because I love it. This makes me feel so okay. American, so strong, okay. so proud of the propaganda apparatus. All right. So special interest have concocted. There's that song. Now let's move on. So All right, Jake. That's how I feel. Jake. Uh, hello. Hello. Right, Jake, we're gonna get you. Hello. Go ahead. Jake, you're on. Okay. Okay. My 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 question should 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 let should Vladimir Putin be uh. Be tried for war crimes against Ukrainian people. Jake, I would love for a Russian or a Ukrainian to come to the College of Complexes as soon yeah. as possible and talk about that issue. I'm talking about paying up in America because I'm focused on the war criminals in America that I know for the last 20 years have joked around, as Bush recently did at a talking game, that uh, murder is funny. Uh, one of these. And, and, and what? The number one thing that is not funny, George W. Bush, is murder. <laughs> okay, Charlie, last question. Does that question. answer your question, Jake? Not, re not really. Not really. You talked around it. You so you you would you would so you you don't so you don't think you don't think that Putin is a war criminal. I'm in the United States of America, up to my head in poverty right now, Jake. Uh, I don't have dental care. Need it. Uh, I don't have a lot of other uh, programs and services for my mother who needs uh, home care funding through the Latanya Reed Freedom Act right now. She needs that. Uh, what I don't need right now is thinking the top people on earth who should criticize other nations are people who have been propagandized by the United States, Washington, D.C. establishment. Because all they do, Jake, is what's known as BSing you. Okay. Because they want to not focus on their war crimes. No, that's, 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 that's irrelevant. It's it's irrelevant. In the backyard doing F minus war crimes. Okay. And if there's an F or an F plus person somewhere else in the neighborhood doing war crimes that you don't know. Okay, let somebody else answer. Hey, let somebody else ask a question. Uh, use of your time and energy to focus on that All right. F minus war criminal in your own community. First. Okay, Jake. But uh, that's not apologizing for any other F or F plus war criminals. So please do not Jake. get me on record of thinking war crimes are ever acceptable by this or that person. They're always unacceptable to murder people. It's always unacceptable 
to, uh, to conduct wars of aggression. It's always unacceptable to conduct war crimes and genocide. It's always unacceptable okay. to think you're above the law because you got a powerful military. Okay. Is that as clear as crystal clear as it could be in for an average gun chewing okay. American? Charlie, did you want to ask a question or not? Yeah, I've been waiting some time, sir. I know, but we were waiting for a second round. Go ahead, All Charlie. Right, uh, it's our last question. Jonathan, I, I was a federal employee, and I took an oath, and I was given instructions you, to follow the decisions of the United States Congress and the President of the United States. And from what I'm listening here, you, you're saying that the, commander. the employees of the State Department and the Defense Department and all the other agencies can apparently go in and kind of decide to do whatever they feel like doing and say, this is the will of the people. Uh, like, like I was a record officer like this Assange guy, but I just couldn't go into work and say, well, I decided to do whatever I want to do with this, these records. Is that what you're authorizing? Like, Federal employees can kind of like decide what they want to do themselves? No. What I'm saying is federal employees who read the law, follow the law, see their communities improving because they and the majority of other people follow the law and then witness people at the very top every day laughing their way to the bank, violating the law, have not only the right but the duty to conduct either uh, lobbying to their local authorities to arrest that criminal or peacefully and democratically mass mobilize. Maybe through the cooperation of the United Nations, if you like it that way, I'm trying to make it as uh, non -conflict. So are the federal employees supposed to follow the United Nations? Arrest. So if you conduct a citizen's arrest, if you know the law, practice the law, and the majority of people in your community agree through an investigation that is thorough, fair, and done through the proper uh, channels, which is be the people, I'm saying the proper channels are always the people with the titles, but it's not. If they say you can drone strike an American teenager from Denver, then obviously that's not the proper channels. I'm talking about all of us. Uh, you can then decide as a federal okay. employee that that's your job. So I, could, I was in the executive oh, no. office. Right. You think you can arrest the president of the United States? Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, so you're under arrest, sir. Be done. It can be done. It's very difficult. We decided. Let me explain what also is very difficult. After World War II, we had to rebuild Europe. And you know what we did? We said we're going to financially bear the burden to rebuild Europe through the Marshall Plan. We're going to have to build new skyscrapers. So people had to get up on that scaffold in the windy European days and nights and build a new skyscraper and new roads. And they had to build American towns too in the 40s and 50s and 60s. That's a dangerous job. And a lot of people say, well, that's impossible going all the way up there and building those huge steel beams. Okay. We were doing nothing but just right. building Charlie a market. And it's we're not a have market to... for our stuff in it's Europe. Possible. Okay. It's rare, but it's possible. We can do it. We have so to cease and desist. Let's just sell stuff to Europe. All right, Charlie, we're going to have to cease and desist because it, right now we're cutting off to go to rebuttals. Can we sing one song before rebuttals? No, no. So, no. John, Jonathan, we have the format. No, Jonathan, do that. Do, Jonathan, 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 what you said is a wrap up. He's got a wrap up. We know it's hard. Why not today? Oh, it's rude. Root, root, we the people. Peace, love, democracy. Truth and justice. Protect Mother Earth at the assembly. Okay, Jonathan. We're going to have to cut you off now. So, uh, who's got rebuttals? I did. All right, Sid, you got the first one. We're going to give you each about three to four minutes. Okay, I'll just do it without the microphone. Okay, just speak so loudly. Loud, loud, loud. No, you don't. Uh, no, no, no. You Jonathan, just leave. Uh, they won't hear you. Right. Hand, them that, hand them that well, one, Jonathan. I heard a program on the radio I got it. about China got it. and the United States and why the United States is against China. I don't know. You go to the IMF, International Monetary 
or the world bank and you say i need 20 million dollars to build a bridge they'll give it to you that's the principle but when they come back the cost of it from these corporations they say well we had to go to another company to get this we had to go to another company to get that and it costs a lot more it'll cost 45 million dollars to get it done so they said china that's what it does now that's what the united states is but if you go to china they have what they call the, the sick the silk road initiative the silk road initiative says we'll build you that same bridge for fifteen thousand dollars and you give us fifteen dollars fifteen million dollars of raw property so that's what they call a win win situation and china is undercutting the united states by doing that and the united states <coughs> can't make as much money <coughs> by cheating these for these these countries and then if they can't can't pay it back the united states says no we'll take over water processing plant and they take it all over and they want a lot of people go so they want them all and they make more money doing that so sir country uh, constantly going into the different countries with imperial, imperial uh, ideas and they make tons of money, super profits off these countries. And China is undercutting that. That's why they hate them. Okay, said Another part is the United States now has bombs that can penetrate the earth. So if another country has weapons under the earth, they can destroy them. And they want to have a first strike against China and Russia. Yeah. But in the process of doing that, you could have nuclear okay. weapons. Where the, uh, okay. the outcome of these nuclear weapons, where you can't see the sun anymore, and nothing could grow, and nothing could live. Okay, who's your next? Uh, all right, let's uh, get. Uh -huh. All right, um, thank you. Let me get the camera on you real quick, because I know we're doing a little bit differently tonight. I'm going to hand you the microphone over here. And uh, we'll put it up on a. Just that, that, just go right ahead and talk. We should be all set. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, everybody yeah. on there? Yeah, yeah, they can uh, hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Ellen Corley, and uh, you know, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I, I agree with you on everything you say. Uh, my main, my main uh, debatel is uh, that. I asked you why you don't run for president and be active, and he says he's just going to write. Or, and I think he should be like Paul Wellstone, or he's got. We need people like him to be in office, and uh, that's. I I put myself in that category. I actually put my application in to run to be chief of police, not because I win, but because they're fascists, <laughs> right? And that's the way we have to be. Uh, Jonathan has to run, not because he can win, but I would like to help him win, but because they're fascists. And 
There is no doubt about it. That's, uh, you know, Are you invoking Chris Hedges? Yes, I, I yes. Feel Chris Hedges in the spirit of that. I, right, Chris Hedges said that, and um, he actually withdrew mm -hmm. from the Green Party because at the same time they threw me off of the Green Party. They threw me off. Charlie helped them with it uh, because they said I was anti-Semitic. I had anti-Semitic words in my 10-page essay saying that I, the reason I got into politics is because, you know, the mob and half the Israeli Russian mob happened to be the ones that got my family, but that's what brought me, woke me up and got me. Uh, Are they called you anti American yet? Well, it, it was anti Semitic neo Nazi, and actually Justin called me the same thing. But then they, I was on the ballot. It was during the pandemic. They just put me on the ballot for my fifth district, the Rahm Emanuel district. The, the, the Green Party put me on and um, they held a little special meeting and decided to take me off. And she called me afterwards. I wasn't allowed. That's to. not at all she, accurate. She called me afterwards and said, yeah, it's because they said you were anti-Semitic. That's not at all I'm accurate. Can I tell you what happened? Well, these are not, 12 not people. Not to interrupt you, but whenever uh -huh. they say you're anti-American. That's not <laughs> true by any means. It's bad. Just say, I'm not anti-American. I'm pro we the people of Earth because I'm anti oligarchy, yes. anti plutocracy, yes. anti privatization, yes. anti corporization, anti militarization, yes. anti empire. Not to interrupt anti you. Anti empire. You can always retort that. You're right. Yeah. I need to. And actually, the LaRouche people told me that they, a lot of their strength is to help me uh, enhance my calm, as Andy Anderson tells me when it comes to. Uh, their, this is what these guys do is they're they're dirty tricksters and they they infiltrated all the parties and put it there so that the good people you know get frustrated or um you know just sabotage from behind it, it, that's another part of fascism and when they when they call you anti something especially if it's anti the most serious thing to cancel you yeah. Well, just ask them to come to the College of Complexes and give a talk about what you've ever done in your life that has been anti-whatever, and then invite them, whatever thing they think that you're anti, then go to a meeting of the organizers who are trying to advocate for people to come together to debunk that myth that we're so divided and conquered from each other, that we're all crazy people that can't coexist with each other. We never get along. And look at us. We're together in a room tonight, having a free exchange of ideas. We just must be mad people. We're crazy. Right, uh, right. And, yeah, we're mad. And, and have them, yeah, get a really good documentary film. When someone calls me anti-American, I like to talk to them about Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and Clara Barton and Henry David Thoreau. And Milton Friedman. Oh, check, make, or yeah. check, check, make, game, match. We can't win again. Milton Friedman, that argument too. Be done. When they tried to divide and conquer us with the simplest thing. I remember at Occupy Chicago, they'd always come up to us when you're isolated. Hey, you don't like that person, do you? All right, all right. I'm in solidarity with that person. Okay. Divide and conquer is the first thing they try to do when they. I think it's rebuttal time. Oh, Why right. is that guy even talking? Right. Jake and then Charlie. Jake and then Charlie. I don't think you're answering. Jake, if you got a rebuttal, speak now. Unmute, Jake. Let's get control of this meeting, please. Jake. Jake's up here. He's Population on the control. Charlie's down. Jake, are you gonna are you gonna rebut or not? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Jake. Okay, this is this is not a rebuttal. It's a question. It's a question to Charlie. Please, please explain to us what actually happened. I don't know what you mean, Jake. I'm sorry. Well, in in, in response to what Alan just said. What? What? The Green Party? Yeah. Well, I will. Uh, I we were interviewing candidates, multiple candidates. To get on the ballot. Now, I didn't even know she was had put in, uh, filled out a form, and was interviewed. When I did that, I recused myself since I knew her personally and did not participate in that action whatsoever. Why did he I did not participate in that action whatsoever. I will tell you that there were others who expressed sentiments 
that you, for one reason or another, they did not, they felt other candidates they had were more qualified. And that basically is it. And that is the process. And there was nothing wrong with it. And they approve and disapprove of all kinds of candidates. He recuse himself okay. and not advocate for me. I did not participate Why in not? that vote. Ellen, Ellen, we're, we're not going to get into this now. Because I was close to one of the parties. I was aware of it. And I had that right there. I thought, and it's totally proper. OK, now, now, now. I had um, not mentored and nothing in the discussion. All right, who's got an extra bottle? Me. All right, Charlie, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Jonathan, for a will, for all your props and all that. You put a lot of effort into it. I've got five things I'm going to go over very quickly here. One, international law. You've got to ask yourself about international laws. Where does it come from? Does it drop out of the sky? What's the legislative assembly that votes on <laughs> to prove legislative law? Uh, you read me a list. It sounds like a list of platitudes. It's very well intentioned, and I'm sure. But is that what constitutes international law? Some guy sits down at his kitchen table and writes them. No, I, I think you need a little more than that. The other question you skirted is, if you have an international law, you need, so you need law enforcement. Now, on one hand, you don't want to have, in order to have an enforcement, you have to have two things. You have to have an army. And number two, you've got to send the army overseas. There's no other way to do it. Now, you don't like the United States doing that right now. But then again, that's why I said internal contradictions. You're advocating that that's the only way to do it. You just said you simply cannot notify uh, leaders of other countries of the earth that they are in violation of labor. Uh, international law. They will say, well, that's just too bad. Three, um, the, uh, what else, what have I got here? Um, oh, yeah, now if we're really going to apply international law, it would necessitate that we declare war on Russia right now. And yep. two, we would invade North Korea. Uh, that's what I mean. So, I'm not certain if that's exactly what we want to do. There's certainly every reason on earth to invade these countries, which are under oppressive leadership right now and significant human rights abusement. You talked about the human declaration of human rights. There's a country where it's totally disregarded absolutely well, altogether. For um, the Here's the other thing. The American people, it's been found, they have little or no knowledge of geography. Oh. They don't know where these countries are even. Oh. And it's been said over and over again. Um, and now you want to base our foreign policy, foreign affairs is really a complex matter. That's why in the State Department, they call it a, a, a desk. They have a desk for each country and they have uh, diplomats and so forth because they understand the situation uh, both here and abroad. And, it's, and these are complex issues. I believe you may, I've been in the UN Association for a number of years and most of the time and I do so because in, in order to learn, I, I, I said there was one way of getting familiar with these issues, but to say we're going to put, now you ask these opinion polls. We're going to base the foreign policy of the United States on the basis of the opinion of people who have little or no understanding of even where these countries are on earth. Uh, that I don't think that's the modus operandi we want to adopt. Now, last of all, this is a really kicker in this, is that Bush and Cheney before they commence in their less, little escapade overseas, in fact, did go to the United Nations and the United States Congress to get authorization to engage in their war. And as such, 
they follow the rules and the procedures required and they are in essence not guilty under international law of doing anything wrong so now i mean you might say that there was some measure of deceit that would be a valid charge however it was open in public forum and discussion believe you me there was a lot of discussion on this and yeah they could stand accused uh they they put together certain assertions which later turned out not to be true uh were they guilty of that it depends to what extent we can establish that they were they were made up or were they realistic it appears to be that they were kind of fictional in content now in that sense but they did in fact follow made compliance with the rules for engaging in the foreign affairs of the united states anyhow thanks a lot jonathan i appreciate it and please come again thank you okay andy go ahead all right andy you're on you're on andy okay uh there's everybody hear me oh i gotta get them all right get the mic on you will in a minute. Go ahead. There's a couple of concepts I'd like to talk about. One of those concepts is spelled out in an Academy Award winning movie called the, movie. the concept of the law is silence means consent. If you're silent about something, you're silent about a crime in progress, it means it's okay to you. You're okay with it. The other movie is The Accused. It's Billy Foster. On a, a woman that was assaulted in a bar, and uh, the lawyer actually wanted to prosecute the guys that stood around cheering and clapping. If you're in, in other countries, if you're a bystander, you watch a crime in, crime in progress and don't lift a finger to do anything, or, or worse, you just cheer and clap and egg them on, like MAGA Republicans are egging on Trump and all these other Republican criminal assholes. You're responsible for the crime. You're complicit in it. So now the Trump has taught the public that you don't, that, that uh, every, he, since he's above the law, a whole bunch of other people on down the line and think that they can assault people or verbally assault uh, half of the Democratic Congress is getting death threats every day. This stuff didn't used to exist in America before Trump and the, the crime, the, the crime of spree of the last six years the only place um one person asked uh what about the saudis uh the saudis why aren't we prosecuting the saudis in court well we don't we don't want the saudis to get anywhere in the court because they will testify that saudi citizens had nothing to do with 9 11. saudi provided 19 or 15 of the hijacker names were provided by Saudis to be used to taxes. Half those guys weren't were killed. You laugh about it, you're complicit in the crime. Because allowing these crimes to go on without stepping up and saying, that's fraud, that's a lie, silence means consent. And I spent the last uh, 10, 10 uh, hours of video time this week looking at videos out of Canada. And what Canadian doctors are saying. Doctors are getting arrested in Canada for curing people of COVID. It's okay to let people die of COVID with the normal treatments, but if you provide that's not the topic, Andy. We don't talk we're not talking about COVID, okay? I, I'm not giving you my opinion, Charlie. We don't talk, discuss COVID, if you please. It gets us in trouble on YouTube. On Just move you can so I can continue. Can okay, please? check Charlie, please refrain. Go no, ahead. no, I will not. He, we asked him. Go ahead, Andy. I'm simply reporting what's being reported in other countries. People have the right to know and other people are being cured all over the world. And now the database is getting as big as it is on asbestos and tobacco. So, uh, but in the early days... Yeah, totally disregard the request. People were, people were paid to tell us that there's no harm in cigarette smoking. Doctors were used, paid to lie to us about the hazards. 
Well, there's big money in motion right now about big pharma and the drugs that are being used to treat COVID. That's just one of the things that's not in the mainstream press. Smedley Butler was famous. So he said, draw a 200 mile radius around the United States and let our military defend that in peacetime. What we have today, silence means consent. We're not speaking about primary problem in America. We've got a problem with billionaire predators. They're like big financial sharks and they just eat everything in sight. Right now, the United States is undergoing the largest transfer of wealth up in the handful of banking, banking uh, billionaire predators that are stacking trillions offshore. And the inequality is getting greater. We have to address these issues. And when you understand it, speak up. The only way people will learn about this is by telling your friends and neighbors in, in person. As Charlie just showed us, there's people in America that don't want us to talk about this. No, I just don't want to get thrown off YouTube because you won't follow a simple request. Oh, yeah, YouTube makes the You could care less what happens to the college complexes, do that, you? That you could care less. Okay. The YouTube, the YouTube algorithm. Sure, We've already been challenged on it. Uh, the all, the this. all right, now let me, okay. Just like Charlie. Okay. All right, Charlie. They have taken us down already. You were notified about this and you disregarded the request. You couldn't care less. Go ahead, Andy, it's your time. Well, um, one last thing. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've been we talked about hunting for terrorists around the world as a facade for our military industrial complex with going about the business. The businesses wartime make a lot of profits. Even, you know, the Vietnam War wasn't a war, that was a controlled military operation where the kill ratio was 100 to 1. So, uh, Iraq was all about oil. The only place they were hunting for Osama was on both sides of the new pipeline being built across Afghanistan. And of course, Osama died in December of 2001. They used videotapes of fake Osamas to motivate the American public for a decade up until the time that President Obama claimed that they tracked down Osama and killed him. And that's how he, he got out of his poll numbers to reelect. So uh, a lot of these issues, um, on different kinds of things. I'm gonna give up-to-date current summaries, not old news like what Charlie says. We're gonna be talking about cases going on right now around the world on key blacked out subjects. That's gonna be the core of my talk, a summary of what's happening right now on Central News 2023. That'll be June 17th. For those of you, we'll give away a couple of uh, books on Central News and we'll have some articles you don't have time to read 50,000 pages, you can read a single page summary of what we're going to provide on June 17th. Okay. Thank you all. Okay, and Jonathan. Hope to see you next week. Jonathan, if you want to rebut, go ahead. Wait a minute, Tim. You have to tell them if we get thrown off YouTube, the entire lecture library will be shut down. All that years of work. Jonathan, Jonathan. 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 Maybe just take All right. the mentioning the word is okay, yeah. Charlie. You don't get thrown off a of YouTube or Facebook. Yeah, we will, and the entire no, 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 no. would be shut down. I've been on Here's that. Here's what's going to happen. We have got the YouTube algorithm. All right. Sometimes the YouTube algorithm is very um. It's very, uh, when you talk about things like COVID or some of the other stuff, they automatically issue a strike against your account. I've had a couple of- But that won't, this won't give you a strike. If no, you no, just I, say the vaccine is safe and effective and you can stay on. Look at Jimmy Gore, well, Jimmy you know, Dore. I, I, just I'm, throw, I'm, throw that at the end, Charlie. Charlie says the vaccine is safe and effective and you're solid. I you just don't want the college to go back to big lies, Charlie. We all want the college thrown off YouTube, no, man. Right, 2.5 million people have died from the vaccine. It's the number three part of the presentation that is controversial like this. I'll take you to another platform called Pitchute.
But when when we but we're better off on YouTube. We, we have to grow. stay with the fucking truth, okay? You're not gonna curb free time, speech. Please. Make Google YouTube stop censoring right, us. Right. A lot of time. The thing is the help we can't fight this the algorithm. But uh you know, and they also have a lot of other user rules that we generally do. Now I've had like five videos right now uh, taken down oh, because of the YouTube algorithm. Yes. I think not. And all I'm asking is that, you know, sometimes when we deal with certain subjects like COVID or some of the other things that they're very hypersensitive about, we just Ukraine? keep it, uh, we keep it, we have to keep it, uh, they don't like we have to keep it set it kind of somewhat down. Now, I had one about nine appeals on this stuff before on these things, but you know, we are dealing with a private corporation and we do have well over uh -huh. plus right up on YouTube right now. And I don't no, want my so account to be suspended. That's we don't want to be suspended. We don't want to harm the college. That's now, um, I understand we got some people in who get upset when they're doing this, but that's the reality of what we're dealing with on YouTube. Now, I'm not going to say that. Whether I agree with YouTube or not, the thing is censor it off. Account. But when you throw it on YouTube, okay? But we let have, us talk freely here, Tim. Have, what is the point of a free speech forum if you can't speak freely about the threats to life on Earth? All right. At this point, I think we're going to let Jonathan wrap up. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, let's hear Jonathan. All right. Thank you guys for attending tonight. I do appreciate all the uh, interchange here tonight. All right. This is how wars start, you know. Everybody gets a little upset. Cut it off and then throw it on YouTube. If you bother to put them on YouTube anymore. Oh, yeah, they're up there. Oh, yeah, right. He does it every week. Uh, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was okay, the best ambassador to the United Nations from uh, the United States. Uh, you got a loud voice. You just Eleanor cut Roosevelt. Uh, Go ahead, Jonathan. Said this. Our own land and our own flag cannot be replaced by any other land or any other flag. But you can join other nations under a joint flag to accomplish something good for the world that you cannot accomplish alone. Attorney General, Associate Supreme Court Justice, and Chief U.S. Prosecutor at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, Robert H. Jackson said this, it is futile to think that we can have an international law that is always working on our side. And it is futile to think that we can have international courts that will always render the decisions we want to promote our interests. We cannot successfully cooperate with the rest of the world in establishing a reign of law unless we are prepared to have that law sometimes operate against what would, would be our national advantage. We do not accept the paradox that legal responsibility should be least where power is the greatest. The common sense of mankind demands that law shall not stop with the punishment of petty crimes by minor offenders. It must also reach offenders who possess themselves of great power and make deliberate and concerted use of it to set in motion evils which leave no home in the world untouched. There was a crime, war crimes commission. It found some of the highest levels of power in the United States government, uh, some of the architects of the war on terror in the last 20 years found guilty of war crimes. And it was in Malaysia, at the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission. And uh, one of the prosecutors there was from the University of Illinois. He's a, a fascinating guy that I really enjoyed the last three months uh, studying is Professor Francis Boyle. Yeah. Uh, he totally censored. Cannot get on the internet. Don't mention his name. It might get this strike, Tim. Yeah. Uh, at the Kuala Lumpur uh, Crimes Commission, the president told the pack, President Lamon, I mean, he's specific. Precise. So the PAC courtroom, as a tribunal of conscience, the tribunal is fully aware that its verdict is merely declaratory in nature. The tribunal has no power of enforcement, no power to impose any custodial sentence for any one or more of the eight convicted persons. So this is to your earlier point, uh, Charlie. 
What we can do under Article 31 of Chapter 6 of Part 2 of the Charter is to recommend to the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission to submit these findings of conviction. The tribunal, together with a record of these proceedings, the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, as well as the United Nations and Security Council. The tribunal also re recommends to the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission that the names of all the eight convicted persons be entered and included in the Commission's Register of War crime Criminals and be publicized accordingly. The Tribunal recommends to the War Crimes Commission to get the widest international publicity to this conviction and grant of reparations as these are universal crimes for which there is a responsibility upon nations to institute prosecutions if any of these accused persons may enter their jurisdictions. You can see that at foreignpolicyjournal.com. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my mom and my dad in Philadelphia when they lived there in the 60s in front of the Liberty Bell. Uh, my mom's dad was an infantryman during World War II, and my dad's dad was a mechanic on airplanes that helped us uh, win the war and defeat fascism uh, against the troops of uh, the extremists, Mussolini and Hitler, uh, the madness then. Uh, similar to the madness uh, in other places, but uh, that's for another time. Uh, I really love this picture because it uh, says all I need to say about how much I love how much they loved not only this country and the rule of law, but this planet. Uh, we loved movies. My uh, parents were kind of introverts. They were kind of, uh, she was a nurse. He was a physicist and a community college physicist teacher. And she was a home services provider the last two years of her career. So we liked movies. And one of the uh, actors we really loved is uh, Harrison Ford, who I think was born or grew up in Chicago. And I never saw this movie with my parents, but I'd like to uh, take a little poetic liberty to uh, reenact the final scene. And uh, where's the where's the big the big wigs? We need the big wigs. Ah, there's the big wigs. Pretend that I'm talking to both of them combined. The guy with the nicer smile, and the other guy with a little bit less nice smile. But they both got purple ties. Just combine them together, and you have who I'm talking to right here. Let's just say we're all coming to him, not just one person, but everybody. Ah, oh, we the people, he says. I'm glad you're here. Can I get you anything? Sit down. We would prefer to stand, sir. Some things have gone on here that I'm just becoming aware of, Mr. Mister says. I was kept in the darkest. You were for a very long time. Troubling things. Yeah. And now we have to sort them out. We have to figure out who is responsible and what to do about it. We have to do this very deliberately, otherwise people might get the wrong idea. We have to lie. Did I say that? No, you didn't. We the people is upset. We're upset. Well, it's understandable. You mind if I give you the we the people a bit of advice. Of course, you all know this because you're smart people. You're smart citizens, taxpayers, voters. You should never make important decisions while you're upset. You did, and American soldiers and innocent civilians are dead because of it. I never ordered any, no. Don't even think about playing that game with we the people. We will not let you dishonor their memories by pretending you had nothing to do with it. How dare you come in here and lecture? How dare you, sir? How dare you come into this sanctified office and bark at me like some little junkyard dogs? I'm the, it gives us no pleasure to do it, sir. As we, the people of the United States, we're gonna go adopt the, and ratify the Rome Statute and have you arrested and sent to the ICC with many other of your colleagues to face trials for war crimes. You're not going to do that. We're not? No, no, no. You've got yourself a big chip in the game now. Y'all are going to tuck that away. You're going to save that for a time when you're own happy. 
and then you're going to pull it out, and I'm going to cash it in for you, right? The ruling class will cash it in for you. Okay, Jonathan, we got to wrap up. I don't think up. we have anything more to say to you, sir. The country can't afford another scandal, people. To protect itself, it won't allow the possibility of another deception that goes all the way to the top. The people will take the blame and feel the pain and the consequences. Oh, yeah, you'll be destroyed. That's how it is. The old Potomac forgive and forget. We're sorry, Mr. President. We, the people, never forget. All right. All right, All right Jonathan, adjourn us. Adjourn us. We'll never Jonathan. forget. We'll never forget this talk. Okay. All tyrannies rule through fraud and force, but once the fraud is See the people, they must rely exclusively on force, George Orwell. Okay. Here, and the Interior Universalist Bohemia Gypsy lesson this evening to you fine gentlemen and gentle ladies. Andy College is adjourned. 